Hey guys, welcome to the Outpouring Orlando's YouTube channel, where we exist to help people grow in Christ, share the gospel, and serve the community. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope that you are blessed by today's message. Hey, if you're ever in the Orlando area, we would love to serve and worship with you. I hope to see you soon. All right, so we're going to read verses 13 through 34, Luke chapter 12, just like in the middle of something happening, Jesus is out teaching, and, 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 and a dude just, just burst up out of the crowd and, and confronts Jesus. And here's what happens. Verse 13, someone from the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus had been talking about inheritances. He had been talking about family issues. He's talking about the kingdom of God. A dude burst out in the crowd and says, Jesus, or teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And here's what Jesus says, friend. Who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? He then told them, watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable, told them a story. A rich man's land was very productive. And the man thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I'll do this, he said. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. He sounds like a good time. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanding of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? That's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Then his disciples, then he said his disciples, therefore I tell you, you heard what I just said to this man about his inheritance. Here's what I tell you, therefore don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or about the body, what you'll wear for life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they don't sow or reap, they don't have a storeroom or a barn, yet God feeds them. Aren't you worth more than the birds? Can any one of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? I want to say that again because somebody needs to hear that. Can any of you Add one moment to your lifespan by worrying. And if then you're not able to do even a little thing, why worry about the rest? Consider the wildflowers, how they grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon, the richest king in all of Israel, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that, that's how God clothes the grass, which is in the field today and is thrown into the furnace tomorrow, how much more will he be or do for you, you of a little faith? Don't, don't strive for what you should eat and what you should drink. And, and don't be anxious for the Gentile world eagerly seeks all these things and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom. And these things will be provided for you. This is a promise from God. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your father delights to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions. Give it to the poor. Make money bags for yourselves that won't grow old. In an inexhaustible treasure in heaven where, where, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Let us pray. Um, Lord, we just thank you today for your word. Thank you for your people today, God. We, we invite you in today. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would speak and minister to our hearts as we study together today, Lord. I pray today that, that it will be a transformative Sunday, that you would change our perspective, that we would draw closer to Jesus, that we will be more like him today. Um, I pray that you would do work in our hearts and I pray, God, that you would subvert our idols today, that if we have idols that we hold on to and we consider those things more important than God, Lord, I pray that you would minister to us today, God. I pray that you would change and transform us, God, to know that our only hope, our only trust, our only, our only desire is you. And so, Father, I pray today that your people will be transformed and changed. I pray that your son Jesus would be glorified, that he'd be magnified today, that we would know him and love him in a whole new way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. The people of God said amen. Amen. My sermon title this morning is From Getting to Giving. From Getting to Giving. And I have a subtitle like it's a book, How God Transforms Our View of Money. 
from getting to giving how God transforms our view on money. If I were to poll the people in this room and ask you, what do you think the topics are that God speaks about the most in Scripture in order of importance? I think that if we took a poll, we would think that some things that God speaks about more than other things would be the case. We would think that God would speak more about faith than anything else. We, w- we would think maybe that God speaks about love. It's got to be love that he talks about more than anything else. Or maybe God speaks about salvation more than anything else. But I, I want to challenge you today and push back on what your notions are and maybe give you a different perspective on the topics in your Bible that are very important. Over, over 500 times or 500 verses are on prayer uh, in the Bible. 500 verses on prayer in the Bible because prayer is important. Prayer is important to God. Prayer should be important to us. Right alongside those 500 verses of prayer, there's almost just as many verses on faith in the Bible, almost 500 verses on faith in the Bible. That, that lines up 500 times that prayer is mentioned, 500 times that faith is mentioned. That, that makes sense to us because that's, a, that's a, a lot of, uh, of times to talk about faith and talk about prayer. But what if I told you that although faith is talked about 500 times and prayer is talked about 500 times, that God speaks about money over 2,000 times in your Bible? God speaks more about money than he does about faith and he does about prayer. What if I told you that one out of every 10 verses in the New Testament is about money? What what if I told you that Jesus taught 38 parables in the New Testament? There are 38 parables in the New Testament and 16 of those parables are about money, possessions, and stewardship. Almost half of Jesus' parables are about money. And if we take the totality of Jesus' teachings, 25% of what Jesus taught deals with the issue of money, possessions, and stewardship. And so for us, that should be an inclination that if God is talking about money that much, then there must be something in that that says that either there's a temptation for us to treat money in a way that we should not, and there's also the the, 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 uh, the opportunity for us to treat money the way that God treats money and to see it as a tool to be used, not something for us to be mastered by. And and so God speaks often about money, and so I want to just let that sit in your spirit for a minute, that over 2,000 times money is mentioned in the scripture, which leads me to believe this, that our approach to money is not physical, it's actually spiritual. That, that our approach to money is a spiritual matter. And in church, we tend to address money by these two terms, tithe and the offering. Tithe and the offering. Whenever we talk about money, we talk about tithe and we talk about offering. We talk in, in small terms, do I tithe off of my gross or do I tithe off of my net? You've had those conversations before and you're praying that the answer is the net. You're praying that because, and God is like, I have nothing to do with what Caesar is taking from you. And, and so what, what we're getting into when we have these arguments over, uh, over do I tithe of my gross or do I tithe of my net, what we're trying to, trying to figure out is what, what is too little and what's too much. And, and so we're trying to reduce it down. And when we think about it, if we take a step back and have a, a, a more, a larger vantage point, what we'll realize is, is that we're trying to treat money like, and God like this transactional thing as opposed to some relational thing. And so we try to nickel it down. Think about this, the person that you love the most. If you've had a significant other, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a spouse, uh, uh, when, you, when it comes time for their birthday or for Christmas, you don't think of what's the smallest amount of stuff that I can buy for them to keep them off my back. You tend to lean the other way. You tend to max out your budget, charge up your credit card in the hopes that you can pay it back at some point in the future because you love them so much you want to give them everything. But when it comes to God, we act the, di- the opposite direction. What is the small amount that I can do to keep God off my back like he's a mob boss? And so we treat God not as God, but we treat him like he's a guy named Jimmy Knuckles. 
right? And, and, and so when we talk about this, we reduce God down trying to figure out the minute details that we can do whatever we want with this 10 once we figure out this gross or net, and we can do the rest, whatever we want with the 90%. We can do whatever we want. But if we take into account the frequency in which money is discussed in Scripture, we may get the idea that there's a tendency for the human heart to have an unhealthy relationship with and an improper perspective on money. So for the person who is a disciple of Jesus, we must make sure that we have God's perspective on money, that we have God's mind on money, that we have God's heart on money. But the perspective about money doesn't just begin with money. The perspective on money what if I told you that the right perspective on money starts with life, not with money? And here's what I mean by that. The first thing that we must come to grips with if we're going to have the right perspective on money is that nothing that we have and nothing that we desire belongs to us, but everything belongs to God. But what if I told you the psalmist in Psalm 24 Verse 1 made it clear. Here's what the psalmist said in Psalm 24, 24, verse 1. It says this, the earth is the Lord's. And guess what? Everything in it, the world and all its people belong to him. And so God lays the ground rules for us that he owns everything and we own nothing. So now we take a step back and we see ourselves arguing over tithe or or gross or net. He gets 10, I get to keep the the 90. What we realize is 100% of it still belongs to him. Right? And and, and so this is is the right perspective on it. I love what theologian Abraham Kuyper says about God's ownership of everything. He said this, there is not one square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. When Jesus is ruling and reigning, he looks at everything and all of creation and he says, mine, I own that, I own that, I own him, I own her, I own her, I own every, everything within the realm of this earth belongs to me. That changes our perspective. So when he says everything, that does not exclude your life. And it certainly doesn't exclude your possession. It actually includes your money. And so from the beginning of creation, God has called man to manage that which belongs to God. So if he gives us something, it's not because we own it, but it's because we've been called to manage it for God. And God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. That's what it says in Genesis. God put Adam in the garden to work it and to keep it. He was putting him there so that he can cultivate and manage that which God had given him. He was supposed to make it better. He was supposed to invest in it. He was was supposed to make it beautiful to the glory of God. And so he was supposed to manage that which God gave him, and that management is called stewardship. 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 Let me give you that. Stewardship. You are to steward your life. You are to steward the things that God has given to you. You are to steward the things that you have in your possession. That means that you are supposed to manage those things that belong to God for the glory of God and for the good of others. And so when we think about a steward, in the ancient days, a steward was a household manager. Somebody hired a steward to manage his household affairs. He gave him an authority to keep his property, to to manage his property well, to take care of his property. And along with that assignment and responsibility of stewardship, the steward was supposed to allocate the resources on behalf of the owner. But he was supposed to allocate the resources on behalf of the owner in a way that aligned with the owner's purposes and values. So if the owner had a specific specific purpose and a a specific value, the steward was supposed to allocate the resources to invest in the way that the owner desired for him to invest in. And so when it comes to followers of Jesus, our assignment is the same thing. That we are supposed to manage all that we've been entrusted with in alignment with the purposes and values of the kingdom of God. God's goal for us as stewards is to manage his resources for the glory of God and for the good of others. Let me say that again for you are looking at me like, man, I came on the wrong Sunday. 
He wants you to manage his resources for his glory and for the good of others. God has called us to be stewards. God has called us to be faithful stewards. But there is a threat to stewardship. There's a threat to stewardship. And this is what we have in the text today. Jesus has been teaching the crowds, and out of the crowd, a man brings a family issue to Jesus. Just out of the blue, he he wants Jesus to make some sort of decision or judgment about a family inheritance, an issue going on between him and his brother. He wants Jesus to settle a dispute, and Jesus is a rabbi, so it's not without tradition that a person wouldn't come to a rabbi to help them make a judgment on some matter or another. But, But in this case, Jesus says something that the people where I grew up with, they, here's what Jesus said essentially. He says, my name is Bennett and I ain't in it. He says, my name is Wes and I ain't in that mess. So, so G- Jesus literally says that. G- Jesus says, who appointed me to be an arbitrator and a judge over you? I ain't got nothing to do with what's going on with you and your brother. I ain't in it. And Jesus is showing us that he is clear on his mission, mission and he's clear on what he has been called to do. If it ain't got nothing to do with that, then I don't want to have nothing to do with it. However, I will address the deeper issue of why you come to me. Because Jesus always sees and gets to the heart of a matter. He, he wants... He, he wants more than that. And, and so Jesus sees to the heart of, of the matter. It, it's what he has. It's just not enough. He has a desire for more. He, he has a desire for more. But Jesus sidesteps the issue about judging. And Jesus gets to the deep issue. And the issue is a spiritual issue. And Jesus warns this guy against what is What is improper stewardship? He has something, but he wants more than what he has. And so Jesus is addressing an issue, not about inheritance, but Jesus is addressing an issue about greed. This is a greed issue. And so when we think about greed, or what the Bible calls covetousness, we tend to dismiss or overlook this temptation. We only think about the big sins. We only think about huge sins of immorality. We, we oftentimes overlook things like greed and covetousness. And when we think about, uh, about greed or we think about covetousness, we tend to think of a Wall Street person. We tend to think of somebody who is wealthy, who is affluent, who has a lot of money. We don't tend to think that, that greed is a sin or temptation that some normal nine-to-five working person would deal with. We think that greed or covetousness is specific to the wealthy or to the rich, but we oftentimes forget about the Tenth Commandment. And the Tenth Commandment tells us we shall not covet. Don't covet your neighbor's house. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Don't covet your neighbor's animal. Don't covet your neighbor's servant. Don't covet any covet anything that your neighbor has and so it deals with this issue of greed and so the desire greed is the desire to have more and more and more a uh, one thing is never enough I always need more money I always need another house I always need another car I always need more clothes I always need something else that goes beyond what I have because I have a greed problem and we tend to think that this is just a rich person problem. But can I tell you something today? Can I blow your mind? That greed is not specific to rich people. That there are some poor people who are greedy. That there are some poor people who are greedy. That there are, there are some poor people that will steal from you. And there are some rich people that will steal to you. There is no specific sin that is specific to one certain group of people. You can be a wealthy person and be the most generous person ever. Or you can be a poor person and you can be stingy as the day is long. And so this is not specific to one type of person. And so greed is one of those things where it's not just about money. It could be anything. It could be anything. But greed really happens when we forsake God to fill ourselves with something lower. Meaning, I want this thing so bad, I'm willing to put this first above God. That that I, I I have to have this thing in particular. And this is not to say, let me say this, because y'all thinking, oh my goodness, he's preaching a a poverty gospel. This is not to say you can't have a nice house or a nice car and drive through a neighborhood and think, man, it sure would be nice to have one of those. Nothing wrong if you drive by a car lot and you're like, man, that that is a nice car. I sure wish I had one of those. Cars and houses are mere objects. Those are just objects. The problem is when we're not satisfied until we get those things and we'll do anything to get them. 
That, that it, to, to, to be greedy means I will do whatever it takes to get this car. I will do whatever it takes to get this house. I will do whatever it takes to be with this person. I will do whatever, even if it means I got to put God on the back burner. And so greedy is not just, being greedy is not just something for people who have everything. It's for the haves and the have-nots. Colossians 3 and 5 says this, therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. It puts greed right along with sexual immorality. It puts greed right along with lust. It puts greed right along with evil desire. And we often tend to overlook or think that this has nothing to do with us and is not important. But God cares about something that you desire so much you're willing to undermine what he's called you to do in order to get that thing. God cares. And here's what he says in verse 15. Watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of possessions. He says be on guard, constant vigilance. Make a practice of examining your heart. Why do I want this thing so bad? Why, why do I want, why, why, why am I obsessing over this? Why is this all that I think about? Man, do I, got, I got to have it. Why, why, am, I, why am I just like, I'm like, they, they waiting for me at the church, and I'm just like, I got, I got to get it. They, 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 man, I, I, I know I'm supposed to give to God, but man, if I give to God, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take me longer to get this thing I got to get. Right? And we, we think that that's just a neutral issue that doesn't matter, but actually that's greed. So we have to ask the question, what area of my life am I tempted to or struggle in such a way that I desire things so strongly that it takes precedence and priority over the things of God. Where in my life do I prioritize plans and decisions around things that I desire over what God desires? And we all have those areas of our lives where we, we tend to obsess and feel like we need a thing when really we just want it. We often think of greed as some but it's gone out and stolen something or having gotten some by some ill-gotten means. But, but that's not always the case. And just like in the man's case from the crowd, Jesus makes this point about this inheritance. Because this is something that fell into this man's lap that he had no control over. You can't force an inheritance. An inheritance has to be handed to you. So he didn't work for his inheritance. He just got the inheritance. It was something that happened to him by chance. But even that which he was blessed with, even though he had nothing to do with it, it wasn't enough for him. He had an entitlement for more. He, his greed is blinding him of the opportunity that he has to glorify God and use what he already has for the good of other people. And Jesus gives a parable. Here's what it says in verses 16 through 21. Here's what he says. Then he told a parable. A rich man's land was very productive. And he thought to himself, what should I do? I don't, I don't have anywhere to store my crops. I, this is crazy. I can't believe that my land was so productive. I can't believe that I got to harvest this large. This, this is crazy. What should I do? Since I'm out of room, I got a blessing. I don't even have enough room to receive. What do I do with this? He says, I get it. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And I'll store my goods and grains there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for years. Take it easy. I can relax now. I'm gonna eat, drink, and enjoy myself. And God said to him, fool, this very night your life is demanding of you. And the things you prepare, who, who, who? Whose will they be? That's how it is with the person who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Here's what happens in this story. This landowner, this farmer, has an abundant harvest. He has what's called a bumper crop. He didn't plan for it. He, it wasn't his skill set. It was nothing that he did. He just got an abundant harvest above the normal harvest. It is crazy. It's gangbusters. He's got a harvest coming from all over. The, it's like it's crazy. Like he has this blessing that he didn't expect. It literally fell in his lap. It's an unusually productive harvest. It is it's an exceptional year for this guy. He is blessed beyond measure, and there is nothing that he has done to deserve or earn this. This is just a blessing that fell into his lap. And for the man, this should have been obvious to him that it was actually a gift from God because anytime we get something that we don't expect and we can't explain, there's only one person who deserves the credit, and that's God. 
And, and this has happened. This is by God's grace. This man is blessed like this. So there is nothing for him to repent about. There's nothing for him to feel guilty about. He's just blessed. He's just blessed. He just has means all of a sudden. He didn't rob anybody. He didn't steal. He didn't cheat. He didn't do anything wrong. And I want to say this and set you free. There's nothing wrong if a person is blessed financially. There's no way that says that rich people are evil. The Bible tells us it's hard for them to get into the kingdom of heaven because they have a tendency to lean and trust in their possessions. But there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. So I want to set you free. So there's nothing wrong if you get a raise. There's nothing wrong if you get a job promotion. There's nothing wrong if you put yourself in position for those things to happen to you. There's n- I, I, I hope that for you. I hope it for you. But there's a problem with the man's approach to it. This man has a dilemma. In the words of that 20th century prophet and poet from the Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood in the borough of Brooklyn, more money, more problems. <laughs> because now he has to make a decision. What am I going to do with all this new increase that I have? What what am I going to do with this abundance of blessing? He has a problem that can turn into a good problem or it can turn into a bad problem. But it depends on what he does with it. He he has a a good opportunity for a good problem. He has so much that he doesn't have enough room to keep it. Can you imagine if you just all of a sudden check your Bank of America, your Chase, your Wells Fargo, or whoever you bank with online in the day is lit? It's more lit than you thought it was before you came to church. And you're like, Woo-hoo-hoo. ah. It's real lit in there, and you don't know how. And you got to make all kinds of decisions. Am I going to tell somebody? <laughs> you ever see them stories, and, and it's like people find something, they call the bank and tell them. They, and then there's sometimes the people like, it's all gone. I don't know, it's 200000 that showed up in there. And the government wants it, and it's like, we made a mistake and put, you, put somebody else's money in your account, and they're like, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I, I looked in the scriptures, but there was no scripture about banking. <laughs> there was nothing that said, if BOA transfers money into your account, that I have to call BOA. And get, I don't know what to do, so God ain't say nothing, so I didn't either. <laughs> just just what, what happens, Right? And, and so, so I'm like, hey, oh, hey, what you want me to do? But this is what happens to the man. It's, it's unexpected. It's money. Fl- it's, he got, he's got all the resources. There's nothing wrong with him being blessed. But being blessed doesn't mean that there won't be a temptation to mismanage what you've been blessed with. You understand this? Nothing wrong with being blessed. Nothing wrong with making a lot of money. Let me set you free. Don't feel guilty if God blesses you one day. Nothing wrong. It's not sinful. It's not, it's not evil to be blessed and to have means and resources. The problem comes when we mismanage what we've been blessed with. And this is why we must have the proper perspective on money that God doesn't call us owners. He calls us stewards to faithfully manage that which he has blessed us with, even that, that, we, that which we did not expect to have and we've received and this is the problem here this is why having a right view of stewardship is so paramount and this man in his parable doesn't have a concept of stewardship it appears that he's prudent because he says i got extra stuff so i'm gonna build bigger barns to make sure i can house all of my stuff that's fine if he was going to house it for a minute and then do something else with it but then he tells us in the text oh i'm gonna take it easy Oh, I'm about to order some filet. I'm about to go to the Ritz. I'm about to go to the W in Atlanta. I'm about to go to the Plaza Hotel in New York. I'm about to do all the things that I've been thinking about. I'm about to eat, drink. I'm about to get some Louis XIII. Y'all shouldn't even know what that is, but you, but you do. I'm about to get all the flavors of Ciroc that they, their eyes can see. I'm about to get the peach. I'm 
I know why, Pastor. <laughs> yep. But I'm about to ball till I fall. But here's what the story doesn't tell you. This man lives in a community with other people. He lives in an agrarian society where agriculture is everything to everybody. He would typically have peasants and poor people all around him. And so he's interconnected into a community with other people who depend on each other and need each other. And so they all share in what they are doing together. So if one has an abundant harvest, that person is responsible now to share with the other people when he has something in abundance. But this man disconnects himself from his community and makes a conscious decision to use all of his resources on himself for his own pleasure and for his own glory. And herein lies the purpose of bad mismanagement and bad stewardship. So here's the problem. The man's plans centers around one thing and one thing only, himself. A couple things I want to show you in this text. Issue number one, the man gets it. And guess what he doesn't do? He doesn't even thank God. He doesn't even say, God. It, it, you know if that thing showed up in your account. Even if they did it wrong, you're going to have a praise party like right there for that moment. You're going to shout like, like you ain't never shouted before in your life. But this guy doesn't even acknowledge God. The second thing, he starts making plans apart from God. He makes plans apart from God. He consults himself. And so here's the thing I want to say. There's nothing wrong with planning. Planning is good. Planning is wise. Planning is prudent. You should not wait to get money to have a plan. You should already have a plan in place before you get money. How am I going to invest this money? Who am I going to give this money to? Who am I going to be a blessing to? I don't want to get something from God and then don't have a plan on how I'm going to manage it for his glory and for the good of others. And that lies a problem. Some of us get more increase, more money, get a raise at our job. But because we have no plans, the, plan, the money makes plans for us. The money tells you where it's going to go as opposed to you telling it. It uses you as a tool as opposed to you using it as a tool. You must have a plan in place. There's nothing wrong with having a plan. There's nothing wrong with planning and preparing to want to be in a relationship or to get married. You can plan. I want to have my finances good. I want to be spiritually healthy. I want to be emotionally healthy. You, you, can, you can plan. The problem is when we have a planning meeting with ourselves and then at the conclusion of the planning meeting, we bring God in and read him the minutes telling him what he's going to do. So God, I'm going I'm to I'm go ahead and, and date this dude right here. I'm a, this is what we decided to do, God. I'm going to date this dude and I need you to bless this. And God is like, I ain't never met him before. I don't know him. Yes, you did meet him, God. He been by the house. He said he might have been in the house, but I ain't never met him before. He don't know me, and I don't know him. But that's what happens when you make plans and then bring God in as opposed to consulting with God. Planning is prudent. It's just that you don't plan and then bring God in. You plan. You let God set the plan. That makes sense? And the third thing, this dude is selfish. It is so clear that he sees himself as the owner of everything. I want you to look at something real quick with me, verses 17 through 19. I want you to read it, read it with me, verses 17 through 19. Read this. Here's what it says. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I'll do this, he said, and I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for years. Take it easy, drink, and enjoy yourself. He says, my, 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 my. Dude is like Johnny Gill. My, 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 my. Like he's just. This is Johnny Gill ministry. My, 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 my. Show look good tonight. But we are no different. When God blesses us week after week, no matter how big or small, and our first response is to think about ourselves and prioritize our own plans and agenda above, those, above the things of God. We do the same thing. Work week after week, and we pretend to be owners because we never ask the question, what does God want me to do with what he's given me? What does God actually want me to do with this extra? We get raises and promotions, and I'm afraid it never dawns on us. Maybe God gave me this increase 
not to make my bills larger, but for me to take this surplus and direct it towards the kingdom of God. And God's response to this man is that God calls him a fool and tells him that his life will be demanded of him. He made all of these plans for the future. He planned for retirement, but he didn't plan for eternity. He made all of these plans, and God is saying, fool, your night, this night, your life is demanded of you. You made plans for the future, but you didn't include me, and I'm the real owner, so I'm deciding to take your life right now. And this is the foolishness of making plans apart from God, preparing for earth, but not making a plan for heaven. What profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? This, is a, this parable should be called, you can't take it with you. Because no matter how much he had, he couldn't buy his way into heaven. God demanded his life, and there's nothing that he could do to pay for it. God says, you owe a debt, and all this stuff you got ain't enough to pay for it. And this is what our lives is like apart from Jesus, that we accumulate this sin debt, and the only way we can pay for it is through the precious blood of Jesus. But this man's perspective is what spiritual darkness looks like. He really believed that his best course of action was to hoard and to keep it to himself. But the question in the mind of the one who has been called to follow Jesus isn't how do I keep it, but in what way can I give it away when I live into the fact that it is more blessed to give than to receive. When we get more from God, it is not a sign for us to become irresponsible and foolish by keeping what God has given us. I love this quote by Jim Elliott. This is one of the greatest quotes ever. Missionary Jim Elliott said this. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That's beautiful. The issue isn't his money, his wealth, his resources. The issue is how he directs it. The faithful steward would have said, God, thank you. What do you want me to do? And this is what it means to be rich towards God. He told them, your life is not an abundance of possessions. Real life is relationship with God. Real life is receiving the forgiveness of sins. Real life is having joy that no one can take away from you because God has given it to you. That, that's r- real life is relationship with Jesus. The apostle Paul says, to live is Christ. If you got Jesus, then you really live it. Living is not about you having more money and having more stuff. God would rather you be rich towards him than rich in your resources. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And he's not talking about financial riches, he's talking about spiritual riches. And this whole thing is a call for us to prioritize the kingdom of God. It is a call for us to respond to the good gifts and the grace that God has given us with our, with his, with our resources. And so I want to read this to you real quick. I'm going to just kind of summarize the last half of what we read. But, but I want to level with you here. For the person who struggles with being free to be generous because you worry that you won't be taken care of. Or the person who is greedy and can't help but to put themselves first for fear that one day it'll all be gone and I'll lose everything and I'll never enjoy it. If you're a person who struggles financially, I want to level with you. If you, I, I know what the Bible says. I know what the Bible requires. I hear it every week. I hear it all the time. I, I, ew, I just don't. I just struggle with trusting God that he'll take care of me. Some of us tied to family members. Your mama can't save you. Your daddy can't. I, shout out to your mama and your daddy. They can't save you. When you rob God to take care of a family member, you make that family member an idol and put them in a place that they were never meant to be. That's real. Hear me with spiritual ears. This is not to say you don't take care of your parents. It's not to say you don't take care of your loved ones. It's just that you take care of kingdom business first. Does that make sense? 
But if you're struggling, Jesus makes an illustration for us. Verses 22 through 34, I'll read these and then I'm going to summarize them. Then he said to his disciples, if you're worried, if you're stressed, that if I give, I don't know what's going to happen. I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat, or about the body, what you'll wear. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They don't have a storeroom or a barn, yet God feeds them. Aren't you worth more than the birds? Can any of you add one moment to his life by worrying? If, you're, uh, if, if then you're not able to do even a little thing, why worry about the rest? Consider the wildflowers. They don't labor or spin thread, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned or dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass which is in the field today and thrown in the furnace tomorrow, how much more will he do for you, you of little faith? Don't strive for what you should eat and what you should drink, and don't be anxious, for the Gentile world eagerly seeks all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. But here's what he tells you to do. Seek the kingdom. And the promise is that these things will be provided for you. Don't be afraid because your father delights to give you. God delights to give you the kingdom. Nothing about that says that God is stingy withholding from you the things that you need. It says God, de- God delights. to. He has joy in giving you what you need. That's a game changer for you. You don't have to worry because God delights to replace whatever you've given. Sell your possessions and give it to the poor. And somebody said, "Er." don't get the secular bag, get the spiritual bag for yourself that won't grow old and inexhaustible treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys for where your treasure is. Their heart will be also. And God says, if I take care of that nasty, dirty bird that is a raven that nobody wants to deal with, the least respected animal of all creatures, a raven. If I take care of a raven who doesn't have a place to put food, if I take care of a raven who doesn't even know how to hunt for food, if I feed him, if you look at the wildflower and all of their splendor, not even Solomon, the richest king of Israel, who had Louis, who had Gucci, who had Prada, who had Fendi, who had Balenciaga, he had all those things. And even the wildflowers are dressed better than him. And guess who dressed them? Me. And if I took care of the raven, that nasty little bird, and I took care of the wildflowers, how much more will I do for you? You are my son. You are my daughter. I sent my son to die for you. And so you think I'm going to leave you hanging? You can trust me. And this is what he's saying. But you just need faith to trust me. Don't be anxious. Go to bed. Go to bed. I got you. I promise you because worrying serves no purpose. Worry has never made things work out for you better. Whatever was going to happen was going to happen, so go to bed. Get some rest. But seek the kingdom of God, and these things will be provided for you. Seek the kingdom. God, what do you want me to do? Who do you want me to serve? Who do you want me to bless? Who do you want me to take care of? How much do you want me to give? God, there's no limit to what I'll do for you. I want to serve you with my whole life. I'm seeking the kingdom. And you can go to bed at night knowing when you wake up, you will have everything that you need. Seek his kingdom with reckless abandonment. It's time out to stop playing it safe. God is calling us to take kingdom risk. Well, you still didn't tell me gross and net. Oh. <laughs> Neither extravagant generosity. Not God, what is the least? But God, how much more? Read this last scripture and I'm done. I'm finished. First Corinthians, I'm sorry, First Timothy, chapter six, verses seventeen through nineteen, and I'm done. This is it. Let Paul take us home. Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, 
Let me tell you this. You might think you're broke and you don't have money, but if I put you in a foreign country or a third world country where people are poor and famished, what you consider a little bit, you're wealthy there. You are wealthy. I'm looking out, I'm scanning the audience. Everybody looks nice. You got, nobody walked here, I don't think. You all already made plans on where you're going to eat when you leave here. <laughs> Most of you are wondering, when are you going to get done? Because my spot, the line is a little lit around 1230, and I need to make sure I make it down time. But if you made plans about where you're going to eat, you are wealthy. Don't set your hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God, who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of what is truly life. So, this is God's perspective on money. He's called us to be faithful stewards. But the question is not, what's the least amount I can do to be a good Christian? How much am I willing to do for the one who redeemed me, who is in relationship with me? There's no limit to what I'll do for him because I love him and because he's promised to take care of me. At some point, we have to stop arguing within ourselves over small, minute details about gross and net. What's the least amount? How can I arrange my life in a way where I am rich towards God? Not to get God off my back, but just as a, as a byproduct of our relationship together. See, see, when I'm planning for my wife's birthday, which is next month, I ain't thinking of what's the least amount I can do so she ain't be mad at me. <laughs> if I stay on the $200, she probably won't cook as much as she does. But if I do 201.99, that should be enough for the summer. If, you, if that was my real perspective, you would question my relationship with her. Because I'm treating it like a transaction and not a relationship. What would actually sound better to you and feel right to you and you wouldn't judge me is if I said, I'm about to give her everything. Whatever she ever mentioned, I've been writing it down on my phone. I've been taking notes. I know what she likes. I know she likes chocolates. I know she likes this type of food. I know she likes this type of bag. I know she likes this type of shoes. You'll be like, ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. Pastor, Pastor, love his wife. That dude love his wife. Well, I'm telling you today, you make them plans about the kingdom of God. And people stand back and say, boy, they sure do love Jesus. Boy, look at that relationship. I wish I had a relationship like that and that is what he's calling us to to know no limits in our love for him not just with your money but with your whole life and he says I promise you I'll never leave you I'll never forsake you I will take care of you because I'm a good father amen I'm done Hey, I pray that you were blessed by the message that you just watched. Hey, the gospel always calls for response. And one of the ways that the gospel calls for us to respond is through our giving. God gave extravagantly to his people by giving his son. And so we give financially. We give not to get something from God, but we give as a response to what God has already given us, which was life through his son. Hey, why don't you consider partnering with us financially by giving to the work of ministry. Hey, we do so much in our community to be a blessing to those around us. We're not here in the business of taking, but we're in the business of giving what's been given to us. And so, hey, why don't you go on our website, outpouringorlando.com, click on the donate tab, and you can give to the work of the ministry that is being done 
through the outpouring. Hey, once again, I pray that you've been blessed and we look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.